So, before we get into this, I kind of feel bad because I don't know who I'm dedicating this review to, you know, being that this was mailed to me from out of the blue and all, but uh, someone named Otis Miller is credited as the game's creator, so hey, hats off to you. Someone with, um, well, I've got three digits on one of my social media platforms. Anyways, your game is the center of some spotlight, so with that interlude out of the way, Love Quest. Now with a name like that, I wouldn't blame your brain for expecting a dating sim. Of course, as the title implies, the objective here is to still get a girlfriend, but the way you go about it feels more like a Pokemon style RPG fused with an adventure game, with some stealthy Metal Gear Solitude sprinkled in there for a bit of tension. Where things really deviate from what it says on the box, though, is that there's actually a second game included in this. It's like a compilation type deal, you feel me? It's a late night, double feature, picture show. <clears throat> Featuring some off-brain Sonic the Hedgehog with clunky Castlevania controls as the side game. Now graphically, as I implied in the gameplay segment, the main game has this cute little 8-bit aesthetic, reminiscent of first-gen Pokemon. Like all around, it just got this cute little Game Boy aesthetic to it, you feel me? Now the side game, you know, being that it's modeled after Sonic the Hedgehog, that's got more of a 16-bit sort of Genesis aesthetic to it, you know, down to the music having the Grady twang to it. But the aesthetic, weirdly enough, appears to be sort of crudely hand-drawn, which as we delve into the story of this, appears to be intentional. Now then, Moving on to the part of Love Quest that intrigued me the most about it, the story. The way this story is told, especially for a compilation game, is very clever. It basically progresses through both games at the same time, in a way communicate with each other, by breaking the fourth wall. Now the story itself might be a little touchy to recap. To preface this, did you ever hear the tragedy of <laughs> the unwise? I thought as much. It's not exactly a story the Jedi would tell you. If that name doesn't ring a bell, Kristen is almost single-handedly responsible for the Sonic the Hedgehog community having such a negative reputation. Like Kristen was the pioneer of the cringy Sonic the Hedgehog fanfiction. Crude OCs, writing trolls in as villains, you name it. What was the most particularly infamous part of these comics is that Kristen would often overshadow the stories of his OCs with a tacked-on self-insert he'd use as a vent piece for his real-life struggles. Which were notably... and struggles to find a true and honest sweetheart as time went on. Kristen got increasingly devoted to his escapades to a point where his perception of reality began to blur. This went on until Kristen's perception of reality became so warped that a religious cabal brainwashed him into believing his Sonic the Hedgehog fanfictions were real. This led to Kristen developing a messiah complex, embarking on a crusade in hopes of becoming a divine life form powerful enough to shatter the barrier between realities. In his eyes, collectively evolving civilization into a Roger Rabbit-esque promised land now what I described might sound cheeky, but if you've heard of Kristen in any capacity, then you're likely aware that one of these rituals Kristen committed was so heinous and unspeakable that Its presence, the great one, just as the prophecy foretold. It took high tributes to awaken it. I least the rapture is beyond the point of impossibility now. In the matter of a few more sacrifices, we will see the promised land. Hey, so the 